Welcome everyone to Arcadia 2020 and thank you for joining us. My name is Matisse Campo. I'm one of the co-chairs of the 2020 conference. We would like to begin by thanking our sponsors and the Arcadia community for making this event possible. We want to make you aware of a couple of things before we get started. The session is being recorded and will be available to registered conference attendees for viewing after the event through November 30th. Conference attendees will be able to access the recording afterwards using the same link you use to join this webinar, accessible via our conference website. This session is also being streamed live to the public on Arcadia's YouTube channel. This event is a Zoom webinar. Only the moderator and presenters are able to participate and broadcast their video and audio. Webinar attendees are able to watch the session and contribute via chat and Q&A interfaces. Conference attendees are welcome to use the chat interface during the event, but we ask that all attendees remain respectful in your comments and observe Arcadia's code of conduct. If attendees have specific questions for the presenters, please use the Q&A function to ask your questions. Questions in the Q&A will be processed, selected, and asked by the moderator. In some cases, the moderator may invite attendees with a specific question to activate their audio and ask the question live. Thank you for your cooperation, and we hope that you enjoy the session. First, I would like to introduce a little bit the, the session. Uh, our speakers are Kate, um, Kate Hartman, Vanel Noel, and Lauren Davenport, who will serve as the moderator. Computation design and data impact nearly every aspect of the contemporary life and the architecture and design practice, ranging in accessibility from user-friendly social media to highly skilled programming. These technologies are informed by the exchange between a technologist and user and its authors. In this context, what is a computational public? Who is the audience for computational design? How might computation design practices resonate beyond the academy or rarefied audiences? How can computation, computation designers facilitate access to their works and its impact on the built environment? This keynote event brings together designers and scholars whose works deals critically with questions of computation craft and public engagement. I would like to introduce our, our speakers today. Kate Hartman is an associate professor and graduate program director, uh, digital futures director, social body lab at the uh, OCAD University. Kate Hartman is an associate professor of Oakland University in Toronto, where she is graduate program director of Digital Futures and the founding director of Social Body Lab, a research and development team dedicated to exploring body-centric technologies in the social context. She's an adjunct instructor and director of ITP Camp at the Interactive Telecommunications Program of New York University. She's the author of the book, Make Wearable Electronics, uh, was an artist in residence at Autodesk P9 and his work included in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Hartman is interested in people and the nuances and awkward bits of their social interactions. Her research and practice sit, sit at the intersection of physical computing, participatory art, design research and human computer interaction. Through the use of wearable technologies, electronic textiles, and digital fabrication techniques, she explores new possibilities for expressive tactile and embodied interactions. Vanel Noel is a computational design scholar, architect, TED speaker, and artist. Currently an assistant professor of architecture at the University of Florida, her research in design and computation investigates traditional and digital ways of making, emerging technologies, and their intersections with society to build new expressions, methodologies, and theories in design. She holds a PhD in architecture, design computing from the Pennsylvania State University, a master of science in architectural studies from MIT and a BA from Howard University and a diploma in civil engineering from, the, uh, from John S. Donaldson Technical Institute in Trinidad and Tobago. Noel has taught courses and conducted research in design computation and architecture at Penn State University, the Simba Singapore University of Technology and Design, SUTD, MIT, and has practiced as an architect in the US, in India and Trinidad and Tobago. Laura Devendorf is a designer, researcher and technologist working at the intersection of textiles, electronics and digital fabrication. 
She directs the Unstable Design Lab at CU Boulder, where she and her students collaborate with machines and develop design workflows and artifacts that envision more playful and sustainable futures. Her research has been supported by the Center for Craft uh, and National Science Foundation and has received multiple best paper awards at top conferences in the field of human-computer interaction. With this, please join me in welcoming our speakers. And uh, our first speaker today is going to be Kat Hartman, followed by Vernel Noel, and uh, the response by Laura Devendorf. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that introduction and thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be a part of such an exciting lineup. Um, so yeah, my name is Kate Hartman and um, in, under this uh, uh, umbrella of uh, culture and access uh, I've titled my presentation, Sharing and Wearing, uh, Culture and Access in Wearable Technology and Electronic Textiles. So, oops. So I uh, am not an architect, but I am an artist, uh, designer, creative technologist, and researcher. My work generally centers around the relationship between technology and the human form. So specifically, I'm interested in how the devices we wear affect the ways in which we relate to ourselves, each other, and the world around us. Sometimes this means creating devices that simply provoke interactions through their physical form. Um, for instance, um, a, a wearable wall that encourages a different type of body language uh, or a glacier embracing suit that mediates the difference in human body uh, between the human body and uh, glacial ice. But more often, my, the, more often in my work, I'm using computational technology to explore these themes, whether it be through physical computing and electronics or digital fabrication methods. So within culture and access, the themes that I'm looking to explore uh, in this talk are uh, inclusion, engagement, transformation, and increasing access. And to do this, I'm going to navigate through my work a little bit, uh, kind of through four different storylines. Um, so what I'm interested in exploring is this idea of sharing through making and iterating. Um, and so uh, I'll be doing this through um, these areas uh, I've defined of wireless wearables, kinetic wearables, social wearables, and textile interfaces. Um, but before I jump into that, I just wanted to make a note that um, for me, as someone coming into the world of working with emerging media, uh, at the time I kind of transitioned from working with more traditional media like uh, film and photography and video and working to new and interactive media, um, I kind of came up in a culture of uh, learning and a culture of sharing. Um, and so uh, a lot of the, the early work that I did was kind of around the time that the maker movement was really getting going, the open source hardware movement, um, and just various emerging platforms in terms of like sharing different technologies online. So, so sharing and providing access has always been a part of my, my making practice. So in this first arc of wireless wearables, um, at the time I was working with some collaborators and considering this idea of uh, how can we make wearables wireless? And at the time this was quite difficult. Um, and so on the, the upper left, you can see an image of a, a project by a colleague named Andrew Schneider. Um, but there were a lot of projects looking like this at the time. So, so wearables that needed wireless communication um, and enclosed in very clunky, boxes um, that weren't quite elegant. And so we were wondering how to combine soft circuits and radio communication. Um, and so we ended up being able to work off of uh, uh, the open hardware design for a, a tool called the Lilypad Arduino. Um, and so we were wondering like, okay, well, this is this, this great uh, microcontroller platform that's meant for use with electronic textiles and conductive thread. Um, what if we could work off of that design and make something for working with wireless radio transceivers? And so because it was open source um, and because of the sharing of others, we were able to, to benefit and design something new, uh, kind of prototyping and consulting with interested makers, um, working through iterations of the circuit board design, and then ultimately partnering with a company called uh, SparkFun Electronics on the productization. Um, and also uh, getting to include our design in uh, the, the kind of larger Lilypad series. 
And so one of the things that was new to me in, in this process of taking something from being something that we made for ourselves to something that we shared in the form of a, a product that people could buy um, is that uh, it then goes from, from products to projects, um, which can be made by people you know or people all over the world who you have never, never worked with before. Um, and so these are just some examples of um, different uh, uh, different projects that were created using this um, uh, this particular uh, tool tool set. So um, from there we started to um, to work through uh, this process of um, sharing in different ways. Um, so working through the process of uh, actually sharing this hardware through uh, leading workshops, um, both in kind of community organizations, um, you know, through uh, like NYC Resistor, which is a hackerspace in New York, um, and also sort of leading workshops in more uh, uh, academic settings like conferences. Um, but still we found that there were some, some barriers to entry and, uh, you know, some people just needed a very clear step-by-step -step tutorial. And so through my lab, we ended up developing um, some uh, initial uh, kind of tutorials for how to work with um, different uh, kind of uh, uh, tutorials for, for, for making wireless wearables um, with particular applications. So for example, here we have something called the superhero communicator cuffs where you can send a message to your superhero partner um, or something called an audience jacket, which would send a message to a local computer to make the sounds of an entire audience when you made particular gestures, whether it be um, you know, thumbs down for a boo or hands up for a yay. And then from there, we ended up transitioning this into this concept um, of nudging. Um, so thinking about kind of in-room scenarios where you wanted to send a message from a, um, uh, you know, you might be talking to one person, but ultimately uh, you would be uh, actually wanting to communicate with another person. So you can kind of think about a situation where you might kind of, you know, make eye contact with someone um, or have some kind of nonverbal communication, but it was kind of the technology equivalent of that, where you could do a subtle gesture and send a signal to your friend. And so we started to prototype it. Um, and we made a few prototypes using the existing board that we had made, but we, we ultimately wanted to um, make it more expandable. And, and we became interested in making a kit with, that was specifically meant for artists and designers who did not want to get into uh, circuitry or into radio configuration or anything like that. So we ended up developing this thing called the Nudgeables Accessory Kit and collaborating with a bunch of local designers, um, fashion designers, industrial designers, uh, jewelry makers, goldsmiths, fetishware designers um, to make all these different prototypes that you'd utilize this kit in different ways. And so kind of looking at it through this different, you know, more design oriented lens of something that they could plug and play into uh, their own uh, kind of making and crafting practices. So these were some of the resulting designs. Um, and so from there, the kits went on to be used in various classroom situations and also in workshops that were taught throughout the world. So moving on to um, this kind of arc of kinetic wearables. So this, this kind of area of investigation stems from an initial prototype that we made called the Monarch. Um, so this is a muscle activated kinetic textile. And uh, what it does is it allows you to uh, kind of extend your nonverbal communication um, through these, this kind of like augmented form that sits on your shoulders. And so we started out by making an initial prototype, um, which uh, you know worked well enough, but had some awkward bits to it, um, and you know it was like a little bit cumbersome and uncomfortable to wear. Um, and then from there, we we went on to make uh, another version. And so we really modified the design in this case uh, to to make it uh, designed in such a way that it could be. Uh, used to make multiples um, because we wanted to see what it was like when more than one person was wearing it. Um, and so to do that, we, we utilized a lot of uh, digital fabrication techniques to make it more easily reproduced. So we laser cut all of the leather that was used in the design. We used um, digitally printed uh, textiles on the interior of the wings. Um, we used uh, 3D printing for the, the parts that are part of the, the mechanism. And so from there, we started to see what it was like if we could expand from, from a single prototype into multiples. 
but we were curious what other people might do with this kind of tool set because attaching motors to the body is difficult. Um, and so this led to a small workshop uh, done at an academic conference uh, called Kinetic Body Extensions for Social Interactions. And uh, this gave us some uh, insight and ideas to how people might use different motor attachments that were meant for the wearables realm. And so most recently this has kind of led to this idea of a um, kinetic wearables toolkit, which is still a work in progress, but we're uh, kind of developing uh, different uh, 3D printed servo uh, motor and mo other motor attachments um, for the purposes of fashion design and DIY electronics. Um, so the toolkit offers several kinds of motions in multiple axes using 3D printed parts and lightweight and expensive motors and actuators with multiple attachment options. And so the idea here is that um, it allows people to prototype, but it also allows us to think more about how we might uh, work with motion on the body. So currently uh, we have these designs posted uh, through a GitHub repository where people can download them and modify them and uh, change them in the ways that they need. But um, ultimately we were doing more testing and we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. So onto this kind of realm of social wearables. Um, so this is where things get a little bit different. Um, and I mean social, and, and you can see that a lot of my work kind of relates to social. Um, and uh, how we relate to each other. Um, but in this instance, um, I'm referring to social in uh, terms of uh, both making together and also wearing together. And so one of the things that I think about a lot in terms of making these, uh, you know, intricate wearable electronics projects is that they're really expensive to make um, and they're hard to make. Uh, they take a lot of time and so, it's not a good example for someone who's just getting started. Um, and it's also hard to include a lot of people in the process. I began to think about um, how could I make low cost wearables that alter or engage our sense of embodiment. Um, so this is the first prototype of a uh, piece that I made called the porcupine vest or the porcupine backpack. And so this kind of led me to this idea of how can I design a workshop where many people can make social wearables in 30 minutes or less. Um, so it's a very short timeline. Um, and I was also thinking a lot about cost of materials. So I, I got really into this, this process of working with cardboard as a prototyping material. Um, I developed kind of a, a low waste design, um, you know, just kind of uh, centered around the, the size of the cardboard sheeting, uh, which is laser cut and then can be attached together using uh, just conventional uh, kind of office supply fasteners. And so the result was, uh, you know, a, a project that was really easy to reproduce. So from there, I started to design these different workshops. Um, so the first one was a, a porcupine workshop and spiky cocktail hour. Um, and so uh, this uh, set every participant up with a, um, a pile of materials and instruction sets. Um, so it was pretty easy for them to assemble it according to the instruction set. But the thing that was great about this process was that they, they didn't, um, they didn't follow the instruction set and in that the, um, the constraints uh, yielded creativity. Uh, which is uh, one of my favorite things that happens in life. <laughs> um, and so uh, there were uh, ample design variations. So we saw participants um, kind of like working with methods of curling and weaving and layering and putting the materials on their head and augmenting with other materials um, and kind of changing the way in which these things uh, uh, could, be, could be built and the kind of potential expressiveness associated with them. So um, the other thing that happened was that it changed the way people related to each other. Um, it changed the social interactions. And so, uh, you know, I think when we shift our, our physical envelopes and we change our sense of embodiment, it changes how we move through the world and how we relate to each other. And so you could see that there were kind of changes in social dynamics in terms of how people related to each other becoming much more um, kind of interactive and expressive um, and kind of working through understanding their own sense of an embodiment, which you can see through the, the broken glass on the right hand side. 
Um, and also what emerged was a new kind of physical expressivity, um, you know, not just in terms of how people interacted with each other, um, but also through um, how they, they kind of use their own bodies even, even on their own. Um, and so, yeah, so from there I ended up um, developing uh, several more versions of the workshop. Um, I ran it, uh, the initial one was like 25 to 30 people. I ran it with 50 people at a different event and then I ran it with almost 100 people. Um, and so it was interesting to see how it leveled up. Um, and I also did a slight modification where we focused more on kind of uh, like, uh, you know, head pieces because we were working in a smaller space. Um, but but it was interesting to see how the, the basic design principles and constraints still still worked in a similar way to kind of yield uh, creativity in, in both the act of making and also in the act of wearing. So the last uh, little arc that I'll speak about is this one of uh, textile interfaces. So we'll, we'll turn away from wearables and look a little bit more towards e-textiles. Um, but this is a, a more recent project that I've been working on, uh, which is titled Textile Game Controllers, which is a collaboration between uh, my lab, which is Social Body Lab, Gameplay Lab, which is another research lab at OCAD University, and Dames Making Games, which is a community organization in Toronto that uh, focuses on a queer and gender marginalized individuals working within the alternative game space. And so we were um, looking at this very specific intersection of uh, e-textiles and alternative game controllers um, and, and, and looking to see where they might overlap. So specifically asking uh, how can uh, electronic textile techniques be used to create bespoke alternative game controllers? And so for this project, we, we look, sought to investigate this question through a series of workshops and game jams um, that were meant to serve as a research creation activity that produces uh, processes and prototypes that can inform and inspire future game makers, e-textile practitioners, and researchers about the potential opportunities that may exist in the intersection between these two practices. So we ran uh, over the course of maybe 15 months, we ran five different workshops within the community. And the purpose of these workshops was to share uh, different uh, you know, material techniques, technical techniques, um, to see uh, what the possibilities were in terms of, uh, you know, connecting these e-textile practices to alternative game making practices. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so this helped uh, both to kind of generate interest within this community. And then it also helped to kind of inform uh, us who were new to the community as to like what would work and not work in this particular circumstance. And so the, the kind of culminatory event was a, a game jam, um, the textile game controller game jam. And so uh, if you haven't participated in a game jam before, it, it has a kind of uh, typical uh, shorter intense structure um, uh, adjacent to, to hackathons or um, uh, different things like that, but, but it's got a bit of its own flavor to it. But uh, this gym was scheduled right uh, in mid-March mid when things kind of shut down. So we ended up a few months later pivoting it to a distributed online format. And so we developed these material kits. And, and one thing that was really cool about um, it being online but local was that we were able to figure out a mechanism for safely delivering tools and materials to each person who's participating in the jam. We had about 25 people. Um, and through that, we were able to share this kind of material physical experience uh, in, in our own homes, but online as well. Um, and so we uh, went back over some of the things that we had covered in the workshops in a more succinct way, including the kind of like uh, computational possibilities of different materials, like con conductive and resistive materials, um, sensing techniques, construction techniques, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the results were great. Um, I don't have time to get into them right now, um, but it, we are currently kind of thinking about the next steps in terms of our work together. So just to conclude, um, I am really interested in sharing ideas through uh, designs, through sharing actual designs for things, uh, through care like carefully designed tools, through instructions, through kits, through making, through collaboration and co-deviating from, uh, 
you know, particular designs through teaching and also through wearing. Um, so I look forward to the conversation ahead. So thank you very much. I'll stop that there. And um, I will turn it over to Brunel. Hi, um, thank you everyone. Uh, great presentation, Kate. I look forward to um, our conversations in the future. Um, thank you so much, Acadia, for having me. Uh, let me begin sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, so thank you again uh, for this opportunity this afternoon. And uh, in light of the sort of umbrella of this presentation, I've titled my talk, Situated Computations as a Form of Repair, Craft, Culture, and Computers. So I think of my work as uh, being at the intersection of the past, the present, and the future, finding old things in the new and new things in the old. So I look at making in traditional and digital practices to understand design, technology, and society, and how computation can benefit both, benefit traditional societies and vice versa. How looking into traditional societies can benefit technology and computation and our approach to those uh, ways of engaging in the world. So in other words, how we might repair design, technology, and society. So what is repair? Uh, Richard Sennett writes that repair comprises of three things. He says, restoration, remediation, and reconfiguration. He defines restoration as a recovery in which the damage and use of history is undone, with the restorer as a servant of the past. Uh, remediation, he says, preserves an existing form while substituting old parts for new and improved ones, where it requires a knowledge of alternatives that might be available and can improve the original or make the old purpose better. And reconfiguration, he says, is a more radical kind of repair that's more experimental, exploring connections between uh, small repairs that we might make and their larger consequences. So in my framing of computation, I investigate computation as a method or an approach to repairing practices, pedagogy, and publics. Situated computations is an approach to computational design that I'm working on and developing um, with this idea of repair in mind. And here on this slide, I have eight guiding principles behind it. I'll um, go through a few of them in this presentation, um, but it's for design and development of computational tools, computational methods, and even how we engage in computational design research. Um, this approach grounds our technologies, our methods, and our work in the social world by acknowledging the historical, cultural, and material contexts of design and making. It acknowledges and responds to a setting's social and technological infrastructure and refuses, it asks that we refuse to remain ignorant of social and political structures that shape our field and our work. It also acknowledges the partial knowledges that we bring to the table. So in this presentation, I'll show you how uh, this approach might be operationalized or can be operationalized or is operationalized. The broader uh, problems I'm addressing in the work that I present here are the disappearance of craft knowledges, craft practices and communities, the omission of these knowledges, these communities from discourses in computational design, and understanding the effects of automation, which includes AI, robotics, et cetera, alongside human welfare, because these technologies usually impact societies least privileged. This is done so that we might undo damages that have occurred in history and today. And those damages could be social, cultural, political, technical, um, 
Two, that we might improve current and future technologies and processes. And three, that we might consider small repairs and their larger social implications. So to expand on that idea, the case study that I will talk through is design in Trinidad and Tobago. In particular, the cultural design practice of carnival in Trinidad and Tobago. So French planters introduced carnival to Trinidad in the 1780s. Uh, you're probably hearing my dog. I hope it's not too distracting. Uh, but newly emancipated slaves reinvented the carnival in 1834. They used carnival to celebrate their freedom, to express their creativity and their aesthetic sensibilities. The Trinidad Carnival articulates cultural practices, meanings, and social conditions. It forms and sustains local communities, creates a sense of pride, brings different generations and people together, and positively impacts local and global communities. Um, there are more than 70 diasporic carnivals that are born from this carnival, and I'm sure that there's one near you. There are carnivals in the US, the UK, Canada, Europe, the Caribbean, to name a few. And one of the practices integral to the design and fabrication of these costumes, as you're seeing in these slides, is the craft of wire bending. Wire bending began in the 1930s. Um, yes, wire bending began in the 1930s in Carnival. And in it, wire and other linear materials are bent with hand tools to create large dancing sculptures or structures that are decorated and performed in the carnival. These artifacts are expressions of creativity. They comment on social and political issues, environmental issues that might be occurring locally, nationally, or internationally. But wire bending has been disappearing and its potential loss signals the impending loss of cultural history, heritage, and identity. Uh, in this uh, image, this slide, these, this, these are images of Stephen Derrick, who was an expert wirebender. Unfortunately, he has since passed away since I started my study, uh, but he was one of the experts I study, and these are images of him uh, performing that craft of wirebending. So some of the issues occurring in craft practice, including wire bending today, um, is that, and this is based on ethnographic field work, literature reviews, et cetera, includes that there's little to no documentation of wire bending knowledge, right? That knowledge is tacit and unwritten and usually taught by a lengthy apprenticeship. So if I want to learn wire bending, I need to go to that person who knows it so that I can learn it directly from them which contributes to a slow transmission of the skills and knowledges. Um, when practitioners die, they take that knowledge with them. Um, and changes in carnival and design in carnival because of technological developments that are happening globally. And this is important because craft and wire bending is embedded in historical, social, and political frames. So its disappearance signals the erasure of histories, celebration and resistance against oppression and more. And two, because this knowledge is tied to its practitioners, it means that when they pass away, they take that knowledge with them, making it more challenging, more difficult to pass that knowledge and that culture on. And three, studies have shown that the quality of one's craftsmanship is closely related to the strength of their ties in a community. So strong craftsmanship skills, strong ties to a community, weak craftsmanship skills, weak ties to a community. Um, since I've started my study, I've lost four uh, of my colleagues. Uh, these are images of them here. So this, is, this work is tiny, right? Uh, so in this project, I developed a computational tool to address the problems of documentation and transmission of this wire bending knowledge. This, to begin addressing this, I conducted ethnographic fieldwork in Trinidad to understand the issues and problems that were being faced, to understand the culture of design in Carnival. From this study, I developed the Bailey Derrick Grammar, named after 
expert wire benders, Albert Bailey and Stephen Derrick, to computationally describe a technical knowledge in wire bending. The grammar is a series of drawings that describe the materials, the steps and techniques in the craft uh, and describes the craft using shapes and rules where it's seen or the hypothesis behind this grammar is that it can be used for design practice and education for social and technical repairs. So this is an example of how the grammar might be used. Um, and it formalizes these tacit rules embedded in wire bending so that they are less tied to their originators, which is very important when craftspersons are dying and or retiring from the practice. It also sheds light on the computational direct dimensions of the practice, opening it up for inquiry by others. So I hypothesize that this grammar, this tool, could be used to address uh, design practice and education wire bending. So I went to Trinidad and conducted a series of workshops to test this hypothesis out, to evaluate this grammar. Um, I conducted a workshop with 31 participants where I won't go into the depths of the experiment, but they had to make artifacts before learning the grammar. And then I taught them the theory behind the grammar wire bending. Um, demonstrated the techniques, the dexterity needed to make certain connections, and then they had to make something again, right? Um, after learning the theory and the practical, so to speak. So th this is an image of them, of the grammar, them going through the grammar, learning it, uh, and making artifacts together. So before the grammar, uh, some challenges included conflicting standards and instructions, of course, a lack of knowledge, um, poor craftsmanship, missing information, and a lack of confidence in engaging in design and making. However, after learning the grammar, there was now an agreed standard for communication. There was improved craftsmanship. Um, teams were able to replicate artifacts, and there was an increased confidence by participants in making design explorations. These are, and in these images, the artifact on the left is the original. The artifact on the right is a replication of it you, uh, from uh, using notes that uh, participants made to describe how they made their artifact. So it was able to allow replication, replicating of artifacts. And so this uh, computational crafting tool, this grammar, was able to contribute to repair by restoring wire bending knowledge, improving technical knowledge and technical skill. And one of the uh, most, I think, amazing things from it was that it enabled a collaborative approach to the craft. Currently, wire bending is one-to-one, -one, meaning one person to one artifact. However, because there was now this grammar, many people could participate by having new social roles in that practice, from documenting how things were made to describing design processes. It opened up um, the number of people that could participate in design and making at the same time. Uh, in addition to this, repatriation of this knowledge that I was developing was also important, right? Taking uh, what I was developing back into those communities to get their feedback on what I was doing sharing what was happening and get their voice uh, in terms of what might be happening. In this second project, I developed and evaluated three computational approaches to crafting in wire bending. And they were developed to advance the practice and to open it up to include those who might be interested in computers, digital technology, and computation. So first, I had the computational crafting method crafting fabrication method and, um, and the digital crafting method. So the goal of this being to create a space for those who were missing, that being computational publics, those who might be interested in computational technologies. And the practice currently has little to no participation by women, children, and the physically infirmed or those with physical limitations. So by these, um, machine-aided ways of participating, maybe it can open up so that these missing publics 
can have a space to participate. So with the computational crafting method, it included use of the daily direct grammar, the crafting fabrication method, CNC wire bender, and the digital crafting method um, based on a digital design and fabrication tool that I created and included 3D printing. Okay. Uh, so I tested this with these approaches with 11 students um, at Georgia Tech, where I was uh, a visiting fellow for two years. And so I taught this class in computational making, computational approaches to wire bending. I had 11 students, eight females, three males. And that matters because, like I mentioned, the craft is male dominated. I now had more females than males. Uh, one student, um, expressed moderate skill in wire bending or experience, but for the most part, no one, this was the first time anyone was learning anything about wire bending, okay? Uh, so these are images, some images of some of the work from uh, that method with the daily direct grammar and using hand tools. Uh, there's images of the work using CNC wire bending uh, machine and the daily direct grammar. And this using the digital crafting method with speculative software, 3D printing, etc. And so in this computational way of crafting, students could learn this craft through computation and they could learn computation through this craft. So this brought those interested in both together, bringing multiple intelligences, visual reasoning, making by hand, making by machine, uh, calculating design, um, this sensory material experiences um, was now part of the design process. Uh, this work was built on existing skills and knowledges and it allowed engagement with materials, tools, techniques, et cetera, that was accessible or could be accessible by experts as well as novices. And so after teaching them these skills, we went to the architectural scale. We wanted to build a pavilion using these wire bending techniques and from that grammar that I mentioned, the abstraction of that grammar afforded us the ability to design new tectonics, test them, so we conducted structural tests, et cetera, so that we can um, go up to the architectural scale. This is an image of the pavilion that we made using those techniques. This is another image of it. And from that project, we started, we, we actually were entering an exhibition, but we learned several lessons from it. One of it was active bending structures. So using um, the stresses and behaviors of materials to inform design. So this was our second prototype, if you ask me, of a pavilion, a lightweight structure based on active bending principles. Using Here we were using fiberglass rods and that exhibition was occurring in Spain. So we had to travel from Atlanta to Barcelona with a pavilion. And this is how we transported our pavilion in a drum case, which in many ways, this mobile nature of the pavilion ties back to the culture of design making and the sheer um, celebration of Trinidad Carnival aspects, social and cultural aspects of it. And this is uh, the work we exhibited at IESS last year in Spain. This was our pavilion. So this work sought to or situated computations and these examples I've shown you, uh, it, it tries to create spaces for participation by those missing. There's always people or communities missing from what we are doing. In our field of computational design, there are a lot of people missing, okay? So this work attempts to create spaces to include those who are missing. It resists the segregation and privileging of certain types of intelligences and skills. So no one way of understanding the world is better than the other. They're different and we could all learn from each other, whether it's by making, by abstract thinking, by mathematical thinking. Um, we have to break those lines down, okay? Um, and situated computations also amplify the stories of marginalized groups. And they do this by, uh, when it comes to creating space, when with regard to this particular project, by bringing those and craft and computation together, by engaging in multiple ways of seeing, knowing, and doing, 
and by amplifying the stories of marginalized groups by deploying their stories and them in our areas of design practice and education. Um, and so that's it for situated computations. And this suggested approach acknowledges, remember, the contexts within which we design that are social, they're historical, they're cultural, and it forces us or it asks that we choose not to remain ignorant of political and social structures that shape them. Um, and that we share uh, back to those communities the work that we have developed and give them a voice. Uh, and I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much. I hope my dog didn't distract you too much. Uh, okay, I will start, go ahead and sharing. Okay, um, let's see. Thank you so much. I will start with that, uh, both to Kate and Vernell and to the organizers of Acadia for inviting me to one, kind of set up this conversation and also just get to know um, these two really amazing researchers a bit better. I am Laura Devendorf. Um, I'm an assistant professor at CU Boulder where I direct the Unstable Design Lab. So I wanna, think about our discussion today or think about the space kind of between um, my own work and what we saw from Kate and what we saw Vernell um, in the lens of tools. So thinking about what roles tools are actually playing um, in practices of culture and, act uh, and access. And so this has to begin with an acknowledgement that tools um, are not neutral. They're not just sitting idly by waiting for us to use them and give them meaning, but they're actually shaping um, what we make and also how we make, but also maybe even a little more than that. And so one of the ways that I've liked to think about tools, and I made a very crude animated GIF here to try to show that it's not just hammers, it's sort of all the digital tools we use, um, even things like language, which you don't totally think of as a tool, but have very important meanings in it. Um, they shape action and perception. And so there's a philosopher of technology, Peter Paul Verbeek, who gives really great language to how this happens. So it's not that tools enable something so much as they invite, they invite certain um, actions and they inhibit others. And at the same time, they make some kind of perceptions um, more readily perceptible and they kind of hinder or obscure others. So I think this is best typified in these kind of common sayings, like when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And also why this slide might have been confusing to you and you were expecting something like this. Uh, language constructs, tools construct, people construct, and they all construct in these ways that are um, kind of resonating off each other and making different spaces of access and engagement possible. So within this kind of broad ecology, um, designers are really in this interesting position to both be using tools and making tools and moderating the ability or the sort of resonance between different actors, both human and non-human, different cultures, different histories, different stories. And within this kind of broad ecology, um, one of the ways that has been really helpful for me thinking about uh, the design of tools or, or even some of the things we saw, uh, like the Bailey Derrick grammar um, or Kate's um, really amazing toolkits for broader publics, is how, um, how they enable different kinds of participation in both the kind of actions they allow for, but also what they allow both designers and the users of those systems to be listening to. So in this case, every tool is a little bit hammer and a little bit microphone. So to give you a sense of this hammer microphone kind of linear line of thinking about tools, I wanted to maybe just introduce it in the context of some of my own work, which is really about building open source software. Uh, I work a lot with looms for weaving. 
and developing kind of institutional programs um, that are at the intersection of craft and technology at the University of Colorado. So in terms of open source tools, I've been developing um, and still am developing AdaCAD, which is a open source software tool for designing textiles with embedded circuitry. Um, I use the software to come up with designs that I make on a jacquard loom, which is still largely a time intensive and uh, very hunched over process. This video makes my back hurt, um, but still very much by hand and engaged. Uh, and the third is the experimental weaving residency, which I've been able to run with support from the Center for Craft and National Science Foundation that brings um, a craftsperson to our lab and allows them to collaborate with us, um, but at the same time sets up structures for them to get a fair wage and for them to have authorship on the scientific publications that emerge. So what we're actually building in this space um, are things like e-textiles or some people call them smart textiles. And within that landscape, I'm really focusing on how we embed as much of the computation as we can into the very structures of the fabric. So I'm trying to take hard PCBs or printed circuit boards like you see on the left and make them into soft surfaces, almost like this one that's flexible and you can throw it, which I always find fun. Um, so just to give you a sense, in this case, the, uh, the sort of trace you would see on a microcontroller is created out of a copper thread. And you can reinvent the, the function of a force sensor without having to buy an off-the-shelf force sensor, but really integrating it within the compressible structures of a bird's eye stitch or perhaps other stitches in combination with a resistive thread. So more than what I make, I'm really interested in, in what I've been able to hear through these processes and what it means, um, what kind of conversations open up. And so one has really been interesting about how um, weaving makes time and takes time, but I find that more often it makes time and space for collaboration. It puts you in a setting alongside someone else performing a menial task for quite a long time. And in that time, a lot of connections and understandings and serendipitous things can form. At the same time, it creates a space for cooperation with the materials. And now, you know, in a textile circuit, what's interesting is if your, your trace breaks, you don't have to trash the whole circuit. There's no adhesive. And so you can actually completely disassemble or repair your circuit with a needle and thread. And while that takes some time and labor, it also creates a really interesting um, alternative ecosystem for electronics. The second thing that I think is really interesting in terms of history is it really surfaces, working and weaving, um, has really surfaced the politics of gender and labor and craft. And I just cited two works that are incredibly amazing um, if people are interested in this, but they both talk about how electronics um, and craft were, how craft became a way to market electronic labor as sort of um, the true passion of the people who were making it rather than acknowledging that um, when they located electronic manufacturing on Navajo bases, they received a large tax subsidy and the people on the, the Navajo reservations um, didn't have a whole lot of other options. But at the same time, the marketing materials were very much about um, the true passion of the indigenous people and weaving and how that lent to better hardware. The final thing I'll put, and I guess this is kind of a funny slide, is that when you're working in threads and yarns, it's not uncommon that somebody's gonna come into my lab and tell me that somebody can use this for something other than fashion or that their wife would really love what I'm doing. There's still a huge gendered connotation around these materials. But at the same time, there's this very interesting way that if we look at the histories of electronics and fashion, we see that the metallic yarns that were used in something like Marie Antoinette's dress were the exact same materials we're using for electronics today. And they were embroidered and they were a status symbol. And it's not so much different when we think about wearable tech and fashion is it's very accessible to only a few people. As we might say, robotics may be only accessible to a few architects. So it makes us think about these ideas of the new and the novel, not as necessarily new or novel, 
but is new uh, is a new way of marketing an object as an object of fashion or something for a privileged group. So in making textiles and open source tools, I've been able to make different metaphors, interrogate history and politics. And the hope is that that allows me to make or to facilitate a space as I think both the other presentations really beautifully illustrated. Um, that's about collectively making not only new things, but new visions and new institutions. And so with that, I actually wanna transition us into the conversation. And so I guess this is the point where I will invite Kate and Vernell to turn their cameras back on. Um, and maybe in keeping the theme of the presentation around um, hammers and microphones and making and listening, I wanted to pose the first question to both the panelists. Um, in terms of maybe sharing, I think their presentations got to this in some degree, but maybe sharing something a bit more explicit or an antidote of where your making practice shaped um, who and what you listen to or where you learned something different. Um, so I will turn it over to the panelists. Um, feel free to just unmute and speak when you have something to say. And oh, one thing is for the audience, um, I will try to take a few questions from the audience. So you're welcome to write them into the Q&A. Kate, I don't know if you wanna start with the stab at, stab at that. I, I, I wanted to understand the question a little more. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Um, I'll yeah, send it I, to you in chat, Vernell, because I'm going to close the slides. Okay, great. Okay, now I can see you both, which is wonderful. Okay, Laura, would you mind just repeating the question? Yeah. Yeah, so in terms of um, a making practice being maybe not only about what you make, but what kinds of things you learn or who you're able to listen to along the way, I was wondering if either of you or maybe both of you had something to share about what you've been able to listen to differently than if you weren't making. So why, maybe in the context of your work, Vanel, why ethnography and tool building? Why not just ethnography? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, this is my personal response. Um, I enjoy making and it's the way through which I grew up understanding and making sense of the world. So while certain things that might be, might seem too abstract, I understand aspects of the world and even abstract theory through making and hands-on uh, digging into the realness of the world. Um, ethnography, because um, in my work, I am not attempting to be the savior for anyone. I am there to understand that culture understand those people. Um, and part of it is validating their story. Many times in my interviews, they come away happier than I could ever dream of coming away. They're just happy to tell their stories, be validated, and be listened to. Um, so it's, it's fun getting to know people, seeing how people interact. For me, the humanity of, of design is important, especially when we're talking these abstract things around computation. So for me, that's why ethnography and the making, it's, it's in the real world. Thank you. Yeah, Kate, and I was thinking maybe from your perspective, the idea of having like releasing products is a really interesting part of your practice and how would it be different if you didn't release them as products? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, one thing that's exciting and also important is moving beyond my own sphere, whatever that is, um, and getting getting outside of my local communities. Even though I'm always trying to mix it up and meet new people and um, you know expand my my networks and um, but and it doesn't have to be through products. It just happens to be that in some ways making something a product lowers the barrier to entry. Um, so publishing. Uh, an open hardware circuit board design doesn't make it easy for everyone to use. Um, <laughs> not that buying any circuit board makes it easy for everyone to use, but there's a difference between, um, you know, having to order something from a PCB manufacturer versus, um, you know, something that's kind of like off the shelf. 
Um, but yeah, so that's been a really interesting process for me. And I've done it both through some of the projects I've described and also ones that, that I didn't include in the presentation. Um, and so for, for me, both through that and, and working on other open source tools, it's really neat to, to connect to different communities and see how these things get used in different ways. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, I wanna ask the question that I just really wanna ask and I'm hoping maybe it's one that others wanna ask, but I wanna ask, um, what do you say to people when they say, oh, isn't craft romantic, but this is sort of a doomed endeavor. Uh, it's not realistic to use this in, a, in the real world. What's your response to something like that? I'm writing it down because I'd like to know. <laughs> Um, I, I appreciated uh, what you said in terms of the comments that some people make when they visit your lab. I, I have had a similar experience in my lab um, in terms of uh, both uh, gendering and uh, deviating the work to what it actually might be useful for. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes they're, they're really great, uh, you know, meaningful suggestions. Um, and I think you know, my work is particularly playful. Um, and I think sometimes that causes people to think that it's not serious, um, but I like to describe it as seriously playful. And I think play is incredibly important in terms of how we relate as human beings. And I think our, our social interactions and understandings affect how we connect or how rifts grow between us. Um, so anyway, that doesn't answer your question, but um, <laughs> but uh, how do I how do I respond to people who say that craft is not? I mean, I think um, you you referenced in your presentation the, the critical fabulations book, um, which I think is you know covers covers some really great examples of. I mean, craft in its own right is is important and meaningful in how we created you know like the clothing that we wear and stuff. Like but um, but also you know uh, you know space travel is facilitated by craft. So many important industrial processes are facilitated by craft, and it's it's not kind of like a hobbyist thing necessarily. Uh, my response to that would be that everything is romanticized. We romanticize the make a movement. We romanticize robots. We romanticize drones. Uh, everything is romanticized. Um, so, you know, come with another question. I think that's a really great point. And it seems maybe there's kind of a connection point in between the two in this idea of um, kind of what's romanticized is always um, what doesn't seem possible or worthwhile. And that doesn't break along um, equal lines, right? That there's certain kind of technical practice processes or tools that are immediately going to be taken more seriously than maybe something made out of cardboard um, or something that's not made in order to fit a certain kind of aesthetic profile. Um, I'm wondering if you can reflect on, on how that's affected your work. Um, how do you navigate that tension between sort of presenting something as new while still um, holding true to the histories. That's for Kate, for me, or for? Uh, I would, for both. Um, yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's always interesting working in any aspect of technology because it so often gets presented as new um, and even something like wearable technology or electronic textiles, um, you know, there are these various waves of, of interest and, uh, you know, awareness in terms of things entering the more public sphere. And, um, you know, I think it's important to keep looking back and be like, no, people have been doing this for, for decades or <laughs> centuries or, um, you know, obviously certain aspects of computation are quite new, but also computation isn't new. Um, and so, so tying back to these practices and traditions, um, you know, even looking to your work, Laura, in terms of like weaving as a technology and, and weaving's relationship to computation is really important. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think I just, 
you know, particularly in my teaching, I try to remind students that, that this, this is not cutting edge and that's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. my, my response to that would be opening up how we define what is new um, because we have all these new technologies that create terrible social issues that aren't new, right? Um, and so thinking beyond the technologies that we develop and how looking into these practices that are socially rich, culturally rich, uh, they form communities, those things happened in the past that we're having a hard time with today. So thinking about what is new beyond the technology. Yeah, I really appreciate that perspective. Um, I think it's such a great point. And I think it also maybe transitions to another question on my list, which, haha, wouldn't you know that was going to happen, um, which is about pedagogy and, and how your practice affects your teaching, but also who you consider to be students and who you consider to be teachers or your teachers, perhaps. And that's for both of you. Um, I'm kind of gonna address all the questions to both of you and let us just sort of unmute as we're inspired. Sure. Um, for me, I teach architectural studio and seminars. Uh, my uh, studio is very much around making, right? As architects and architecture students, that that's what we do. But even in my seminars, if whether I'm teaching a making class or a theory class, we unpack those theoretical concepts through making. Um, and in both, it's because I'm trying to cater for the different ways that people understand the world. If, if you didn't grow up reading, um, you know, Roman or Greek stories and theory, it's okay. You could still understand certain concepts by making. Um, and regarding who's a teacher or a student, it depends, but I know all teachers learn from their students. My best experiences are with my students. My students at Tech were amazing. We were all learning together, sharing together. And for me, that's the fun of this communal hands-on making way of teaching and learning that we all uh, have this mediated space to talk to each other, share, laugh, uh, and debate ideas and issues. Yeah, I mean, I, I think my students are my teachers, <laughs> as, are, as are my teachers. I was on a really beautiful um, meetup call last night that's like a gathering of people working in physical computing across uh, several different institutions. And, and somehow in the mix of all of it, it came out that there were so many different generations of teacher, student, teacher, students um, over like two decades on this, on this one call that was relatively intimate. It was kind of beautiful, um, you know, because I was on there and I brought my students in, but then one of my old teachers was there. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, just in general, I, I feel like there's a really close relationship between my, my research and my teaching. And, um, you know, one of the joys of being able to teach in your area is that you can like immediately bring things into the classroom um, in a really meaningful way. And, uh, you know, the thing I think I learned the most from my students is to challenge my assumptions. Um, and, uh, you know, going back to the, the, the you know, aspects of craft and making, um, you know, I, I try as much as I can to, to make alongside my students, because even that makes me challenge the assumption of how long it takes to do something. <laughs> um, and uh, I was teaching, teaching like a weekend workshop a couple weekends ago, and it was a new group that I never had contact with before, and, and they had to, to sew their first electronic circuit. And so, you know, we sat on Zoom together and I sewed with them. And, you know, it just, uh, you know, after all these years blew my mind at how long it took us to, to sew a single circuit. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would also say I learn mostly from my students. <laughs> They're not uh, as jaded as I am, which I find really refreshing. Um, they still have some belief <laughs> where I sometimes can be the downer in the group. So I always have to encourage them with like hopeful articles towards the end of the semester. Um, I do kind of want to switch the discussion a bit, uh, maybe focusing on this theme of repair. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A from Maria Yablanina. Um, 
And it does seem like our Q&A is a bit shy today. So if there are other people that are maybe itching to ask a question, um, I'd love to get the chance to, to ask it to the panel and, and get you some feedback on that. But in the meantime, I'll ask this question um, from Maria to Vernell, which says, it seems that repair is not giving as much attention as it deserves in the fields of architecture and specifically computational design and digital fabrication. I was wondering if you could be open to speculate why this is the case and what we can do as a community to shift the focus towards repair and care in architecture. That's a great question, Maria. Um, off the top of my head, I think it's it has a lot to do with funding and what's being pushed. Let's face the truth, we try to go where the money is, right? Um, and if there's a societal um, economic push to how we use and engage, because funding matters for our work also, right? Um, you know, using robots, um, using these technologies to be ahead of the game, which is important, right? We have to know the possibilities so that we can hedge our bets for uh, bad things that might happen, to put it that way. Um, but maybe it's because people don't think it's sexy enough, right? Um, and so going to repair and fixing those things is not as bright and sparkly and shiny as, as the, new, um, the new and the innovative, or however we use those words. So I think as a field, I think that's a deeper question that we all should ask ourselves. Um, because personally, some of us might like going back into the old things, but maybe there's no traction there. So I think that's a discussion that butts up against the realities of research. Yeah, and maybe to expand on that and to open the question to Kate as well, like how do you see the relationship between repair and documentation or even documentation and the kind of, I don't know if you both are familiar with the term, the like silence of the archives. Um, but when you are making documentation, are you thinking about it as kind of a cultural preservation practice or more of a, a means to an end in terms of having somebody replicate something? Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a really interesting question and one that's come up in conversation um, uh, you know, with, with my students and, and beyond, um, but just, that difference between documenting as a way to show someone what you did versus documenting in a way to um, allow that person to make what you made. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, I think, I think you know, the, the work, and, and that, that, that extends to repair, right? Because if you understand if so, how something is made, then you understand how to repair it, um, which is part of why I find Brunel's work so interesting. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there's more movement towards, um, this other form of documentation. And I think there was a whole wave of, of people kind of thinking they were doing that in terms of, you know, showing how to make something, but it actually wasn't that accessible. Um, but now there are kind of interesting emerging tools, um, that some of them are very inherently, um, discipline specific. Um, so for instance, uh, we had a student who just finished an undergraduate program, Omid Adahadi, who is looking at 3D printing and, and augmenting a 3D print design in terms of talking about all the minute decisions along the way of what it actually takes to make the print and not just handing someone the file. Um, if I'm remembering your question right, Laura, for me, I would say um, the documentation is important. Um, in, in my work though, the artifact or the way I think of the process of computational design, the end result or the product is not the goal, but it's all the meat in between is the real thing. So the, you know, the social, the conversations, um, the things that people learn, for me, that's the main part of the work so that these people, these stories, these skills, um, it's, it could be translated through them. The artifact just facilitates that. Yeah, I like how you say that. Um, and I think it also kind of brings up some interesting points that were also in Maria's question, but maybe we could draw a little more 
around care and working with communities. And so it is quite interesting that in both of your practices, you're really deeply engaged um, with an audience or with a community, maybe in slightly different ways. Um, and so I'm wondering just for others who might be interested in cultivating those kinds of relationships, um, how do you build them and how do you sustain a relationship in your research? Or sort of a, fruit, a fruitful collaborative craft relationship maybe. I can answer quickly because I bet Vernell has more to say about this, but um, uh, I mean, I, I have worked amongst different communities for a long time, but I, I think my more recent work um, with the textile game controllers was my, my first kind of like more durational embedded contact with a community that was different from my own. Um, but it was interesting because one of the, the organizers um, was a former member of my lab. And so we, we had this kind of deeper, longer personal connection that we've been building over time. Um, and I think that trust built through collaboration and co-working and all of that led to us being able to bridge our two organizations together. Um, and then, you know, through kind of uh, relating over the course of two years, you know, doing a bunch of workshops before leading up to a bigger event, um, we started to uh, connect with the community in a deeper way. Um, and now we're looking at, you know, what we can do next. So I think it's, you know, for me, not a matter of like doing the project and dropping it and running, um, but, but having a more sustained connection um, and, and working together in a longer way. Um, in addition to what Kate has said, um, so I'm from Trinidad, so that cultural connection I had with my informants, but I was not a part of the carnival, let's say, that community. So, you know, I had to find someone to give me entree to that community, right, to introduce me to that. And research takes time, especially, you know, research that are with humans. So, you know, yes, I interview, I observe, but I'm sure they're also gauging me, right? Um, as is important in uh, these practices and what is shared because that determines what and how much people also share with you. So trust is really important. Um, and mm, those relationships are just as how we form usual human relationships. So constant conversations, we would eat together, they would cook for me. Uh, these very social and real embedded ways of how humans interact um, is part of the research process. So when I do things, I share with them, I call them every now and again to find out how things are going. Uh, it's, it's a sustained relationship that takes time for sure. Yeah, I love, um, I was asked once, you know, what I could do to bring more collaboration to this space I was working in. Mm -hmm. And I thought back um, to maybe something like Pier 9 or other places I'd worked where it was just like, well, just add a kitchen. <laughs> like, if you bring a yeah. kitchen in there, somehow different things yeah. start to kind of emerge, which yeah. um, I think maybe resonates with that a bit. Um, I'm going to move to a question from the audience, and I, ho I hope I say the name correctly, and I apologize if I don't, but it's from Rebecca Duque Estrada, and they write, first of all, I would like to thank you three for making such an amazing panel with so many important inputs and points of view. Uh, I'll say you're welcome on behalf of all of us. <laughs> um, my question would be for all of you, how do you bring playfulness and openness, chances uh, to make mistakes to academia. I mean, I can say that my mistakes came first and academia came second. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I like awkwardness and weirdness and I like kind of a guts out approach. And so that's just always how I've approached things through my art making, through my research. Um, and so, uh, I don't know, I mean, part of that for me, part, part of making things that that have a, a I'm gonna call it a playful edge to them, <laughs> um, uh, is, is about um, creating space 
for other people to be playful. And, and one of the reasons why I really like wearing working in wearables is the potential to transform even just a little bit through embodying um, a different space or a different identity um, that allows people to kind of distance themselves a little bit from their self-conscious natures um, and, you know, release in a, in a way that wouldn't be able to be done just kind of like in their everyday format. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, my response to that would be, it might be a personal one, but one of my dreams in life is to have grandkids and my grandkids say, grandma, you play too much, right? Um, I just like to play. Um, the culture I come from is a playful one. I've been blessed enough to play when I was young. And so my approach to teaching studio, everything is one that is, like Kate said, serious play. Uh, if my students aren't having fun, we need to rethink this um, because I believe that's where uh, creative juices really comes forth by giving everyone the space to fail because you only learn through failing. Um, you don't learn any other way. You have to fail. And so understanding that the more you fail, it means you're closer to figuring that thing out. Um, so it's all about the play. Yeah. I do both of you, are you familiar with Karita Kent's eight rules? Or is it 10 rules? Oh no, I don't remember how many rules she had. But um, one of them is that you can't make and analyze at the same time and that they're different processes. And I've always found that when I'm feeling that kind of critical impulse when I'm making um, to be really freeing. It's like, no, no, those two things cannot go together. If you're gonna truly kind of make something, you have to create a space. Um, for something unexpected to happen, which sometimes is really bad and sometimes does something that's a little more like, oh, I can, I can pick this up in some way. Um, my husband always reminds me of really great musicians that made really terrible albums when I'm feeling <laughs> critical. <laughs> so maybe listening to some of David Bowie's lesser known albums <laughs> can be <laughs> really constructive when you're, you're hitting a creative um, failure struggle. Um, I'm going to actually shift to another audience question from Shelby Doyle, um, which again says, thank you for the wonderful presentations. I don't know if I should read that part. It feels odd reading out a compliment, but again, thank you on behalf of all of us. Um, for there to be access, I think there needs to be a public. Who is the computational public? Where these ideas escape the academy or seemingly, where do these ideas escape the academy or seemingly esoteric practices? And why is craft an effective way to engage with this computational public? Are there other methods available or is craft unique? So I can maybe summarize that if, if we wanna piece it apart, but for now you unmuted. So I'm gonna suggest maybe you have something to say. Sure. Or your dog um, might have something to say. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I was looking back at. Um, thank you for acknowledging her. Um, I would say, Shelby, thanks for that question. Everyone is a computational public. We are all computational publics. From the very moment we started counting humanity, we became computational publics. Um, today, they're using our data for certain decisions, everyone is a computational public, which is why it's important that we, and I mean we as a field, um, work with those outside of our bubble to show them how they are part of that computational public and remind us that we owe that to them to, I don't wanna say educate them, all right, but to us, like we learn from them and they're learning from us how computation is changing and affecting our society because they are affected. Um, so I think it's important that we remind ourselves that we have a responsibility to them. I mean, I... Maybe I'll go to the second part of that question in terms of why craft is an effective way to engage with this computational public. Um, and I, I, I'm just a big fan of 
embodiment in physicality. And I realized the irony of saying that through this little box, but, um, <laughs> but, but still like, it, it's still important. We're still, we still have these bodies and, and, you know, like we are still having an experience in the physical world, even though we're, we're sharing a virtual space. Um, and one of the things that I love about craft, which isn't limited to craft, but is this engagement with the body um, and, and embodied knowledge. Um, and I think, you know, embodied knowledge is knowledge that has been around for as long as we've existed. Um, and, you know, it goes back to that whole acknowledgement of, of all these practices that have come before us. And, uh, you know, craft offers these great opportunities to invite people. I mean, you know, craft is not simple. Um, I think that's one of the other kind of terrible things that happen is people are like, oh, craft is just, you know, go to the craft store and, um, <laughs> and, and it's great. Like, it's really cool that there are aspects of craft that are very accessible, but there are also aspects of craft, you know, that are extremely advanced and, um, you know, you have to apprentice or you have to invest huge amounts of time. Um, but I do like that on ramp of the kind of physical and embodied engagement. And I think, I think that's a way to kind of break down some, some barriers in terms of helping people feel included and engaged in learning particular material. Yeah, I, um, I'm going to try and get a tone from the audience chats, but since we are maybe coming towards the end of our time, I maybe wanted to have us wrap up with something pithy, you know, and, and maybe actionable for the audience. And there are questions in the chat that um, ask a bit of the question of like, how inclusion, right? How do we do that? <laughs> so both um, in one sense, in our teaching, how do we make our teaching more inclusive? And then in our research, how do we make, what advice would you give to somebody who said, I wanna make my research more inclusive? Um, where would you tell them to start? I would quickly say, start by looking and paying attention to who's not there, who's not there in your research, who's not there in what you're reading, um, who's not there in your school or your classroom. That's a good way to start. Yeah, and I, I guess just also include include more people and include different people and challenge challenge your own notions of what different is, um, and also um, just yeah. I mean, I think the the opening up um, of process and uh, is really important to me um, in terms of inclusivity is just um, getting people more involved and more aware of how things are made um, really opens up all these opportunities and new perspectives um, and helps us challenge our assumptions about everything. Sorry, clicked the wrong tab there at the end. Um, yeah, I think you're, you're, both of you kind of remind me of um, Donna Haraway, who I always really love, um, but sort of encourages us to attend to the differences that make a difference. Um, so not sort of considering differences as such, but actually how they perform and how they resonate and how they ripple through. Um, and so just because I, I love Donna Haraway and ending on that point, um, maybe I will uh, say thank you just for letting me facilitate this conversation and going along with some of my questions um, and for letting me get to know both of you better. I've, I've really appreciated it. And I'm so inspired by what you've said. Um, and I do think I need to turn it back to Matthias at this point um, to, to usher the conference along. Well, first of all, thank you, Ramel, and Laura Davis, for an amazing keynote event. I know that, you know, suddenly questions started really to explode, and we could have gone on for a very long time with this. Thank you so much. It was absolutely amazing. Your thoughtful perspectives on the entanglements of culture and access are highly appreciated. Uh, maybe a few notes on tomorrow's events and for those who are you watching on YouTube, a reminder that you can still register to view the rest of the conference events and that registration for students is free. Uh, the next event coming up is the Field Notes Pecha Kucha Night, which will start at 6 p.m. Uh, but I would uh, please join us for the coffee break at the Pink Murmur Room, accessible through the proximitiesarchiated.org website. To the left corner, drop down menu, go to the break room, select the pink room. And yes, please enjoy the rest of the conference and see you later. Thank you. Bye.